Uh, so I'll just read his bio. So Greg Brown, Pastor Bre Greg Brown, is originally from Austin, Texas. Anybody from Austin, Texas in the house? Sorry, man. <laughs> this happens every time. Every time I do this, like nobody. Austin, Texas, though, all right. Uh, he is married to Tara and uh, has a six-year-old daughter named Saya. Uh, he has been serving in pastoral ministry for over 15 years and is also a 13-year veteran of the U.S. military. Currently, he is a university chaplain at Handong Global University in South Korea, which includes being the teaching pastor at Handong International Congregation and a professor teaching introductory Bible courses. In addition, Greg is the author of a best-selling Bible study series called The Bible Teacher's Guide. If you've ever been on Bible.org, you might have read some of his uh, posts. And so uh, we're privileged to have him. So can we give a new harvest welcome to Pastor Greg Brown? In your bulletins, there's an outline. We'll be looking at Genesis chapter 13, how to respond in faith to conflict. I'm going to go ahead and read the chapter for us, and after that, we'll take a moment to pray. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's. The Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Is not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan toward Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abraham, Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, Look around from where you are, to the north and the south, to the east and the west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents. There he built an altar to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. If you could take one second, if you could pray for the person on your left and right, that God would speak to them in a special way, that they'd hear God's voice. And then if you could pray for me, that God would give me the exact words to say, and then we'll get started. Father, bless your word, bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How should believers respond in faith to conflict? We live in an age where there's conflict everywhere. We see it in society with the constant lawsuits. We see it with the political unrest from various sides of the political spectrum. We see it globally with never-ending wars. But even worse, we see it commonly in our churches which sometimes is the very thing that discourages so many Christians 
They've seen so much discord in their churches. They've seen it in their families. And so we live in a world that is just prone to discord. When we look at the narrative of Scripture, we see that discord was common with the people of God, unfortunately, right? Cain killed his brother Abel. Jacob's ten sons sold Joseph into slavery. When we get to the New Testament, we even see in the church of Philippi, there are two women, Judea and Sinti, that are arguing and fighting in the church in chapter 4. When you look at Corinth, they were known for their discord. In chapter 1, they're, they're getting behind certain teachers and saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. In chapter 6, they are suing one another. There was discord happening in the early church. We know also that Paul and Barnabas, on their missionary journey, um, they get into a fight over whether John Mark can go with them, and they split and go two different ways. In fact, discord is so prevalent, Paul says this in Ephesians 4.26. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and give the devil a foothold. Basically, he says, you're going to get angry, and when you're angry, don't sin when you're angry, And when you're angry, go ahead and get rid of it before the night is over, unless Satan gets a door in your life. And so there is discord. We see that there is discord is common to the human condition. One of the problems when we consider discord in the church, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about how God is a God of order. He's a God of peace. Whenever there is disorder in the church of God, disorder in our relationships, what we will find is that we many times lose the blessing and the activity of God in our lives. Here in this text, in Genesis 13, we see Abraham, who is called in Galatians chapter 3, the father of all who believe, right? In Hebrews 11, he's considered one of the heroes of the faith. And here, when he has a conflict with his nephew Lot, we see something about how faith should respond to conflict. Faith is not simply just believing in God and accepting him as our Lord and Savior. Scripture says faith is how we live every aspect of our life. The just shall live by faith. Your eating and drinking should be in faith. Your relationship should be in faith. Your, how you handle conflict should be in faith. And so we learn something like this when we look at Abraham in this text. Yes, Abraham has many falls in his life. But here in this narrative, we see Abraham or Abram at his best. He's Abraham later on. He's Abram early on. I'll be calling him Abraham throughout the sermon. Otherwise, I'll get mixed up. One of the things that's interesting, when you look at this text in Genesis chapter 13, after Abram responds faithfully to the situation with Lot, God takes him and he says, Abraham, lift up your eyes. Look north and south and east and west. Look at the land. I'm going to give your descendants this land. And and this is important because when you're going throughout the narrative of Genesis or the narrative of Abraham, God does this at special junctures in Abraham's life. Genesis 12, right after leaving Haran and coming to Canaan, he says, I'm going to give your descendants this land. In Genesis 15, after Genesis 14, where he defeats these armies and gets back Lot, He says, I'm going to make your descendants like the stars. In Genesis chapter 22, after he was willingly willing to offer offer his son, he says, I am going to give you one of your offspring. The singular offspring is going to be a blessing to the nations. And so we see that even though conflict is natural to the human condition, where we tend to commonly get in conflict with friends and family members, etc., our relationships are special to God. Our relationships and how we respond to those relationships can affect whether we are walking in God's blessing or the blessing of God is removed from us. Christ said this in Matthew chapter 6. He says, if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. In Matthew chapter 18, he gives the parable of the unforgiving servant. And he says, if you don't forgive others from the heart, then God will treat you, give you over to the torturers. Meaning, by living in conflict... We can miss out on the blessing of God, but not just miss out on the blessing of God. We can actually walk in the discipline of God. And so your relationship with your mother and your father, your relationship with your co-workers, those relationships are important. He died for those people. He died for those people. And therefore, how you handle them 
is very important to the God who is our Father. Now, as we look at this narrative, one of the unfortunate things about dealing with conflict, many times our conflict is with people that we care about the most. Like I said, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a wife, because the people that we care about the most have the most ability to hurt us. Now, that's the unfortunate reality that when you're looking at conflict, but that's part of the reason it's so important for us to know how should we respond in faith to conflict. We learn a lot as we look at Abraham, the father of those who believe. So in your outline, there are notes. You can take notes as far as uh, the points that I give you that make it a little easier. I tend to be a little bit, I'm going to try not to be long-winded. What, what time do I have to be done? Because otherwise it may just not end. <laughs> They didn't tell me, so I'm taking that. It means I can keep going. All day. All day. Amen. Amen. Here's the first one. 250? <laughs> 230. All right. Here's the first one. To respond in faith to conflict, believers must seek unity by living in communion with God. Believers must seek unity by living in communion with God. When you look at verse 13 through 1 through 4, we see that this is, this is the backdrop after chapter 12. If, you, if you've been reading through the narrative of Genesis or the narrative of Abraham, Abraham leaves Haran, comes to the promised land, and there is a famine in the land. You've got to imagine that was very disappointing. He left his home, his family. He says, hey, God has good plans for us. And he gets there, and he finds that things are not that good. Maybe for some of you, it was like that when you came to Korea. Let me tell you, it's not that uncommon. Not about the Korea thing, but when following God, many times we go to places and find it's not exactly what we were thinking, right? And so Abraham gets to the promised land, and there's a famine. So he, instead of staying in the promised land, he just gets up and heads down to Egypt. And there, which it seems like it's a lapse in faith, he almost loses his wife to Pharaoh, and then he goes back to the promised land after God restores his wife, and he goes to the altar that he built when he first got to Canaan. And there he worships God. He worships God at Bethel. It says he, it says he in, verse, in verse 4. Then if we went down to verse 18, the very end of the chapter, after he reconciles with Lot and after God shows him the land, he says this. So Abraham moved his tents and went near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. One of the things that's very special about chapter three, 13 is that it's bracketed with altars. It's bracketed with worship. In fact, where he ends up at the very end of the chapter, the word Hebron in the Hebrew actually means communion. So Abraham, so Abraham when he goes back to the, to the promised land, it seems to be a form of repentance. He goes back to the altar that he was at. He, he worships the Lord, and then he has this, works out this situation with, with uh, Lot. In the same way, one of the ways that you are going to respond in faith to conflict is by living a life of communion with God, constantly being in his presence and in worship and in prayer. Paul said this in Galatians 5.20 in describing the sinful nature that we all struggle with. Listen to what he says. The fruits of the flesh are hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Let me just summarize that as discord. Like apart from you walking in the spirit that God has given you, you will destroy many relationships in your life or others will try to destroy the relationships. It's part of the human condition. Right after the fall, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, when God prophesies to the woman the things that are going to happen in her life because of the sin, he says, your desire will be for your husband, meaning to control him, and your husband will dominate you. The, from that genesis of discord in the marriage that was prophesied about sin came every discord, the brother killing the other brother, and war, and ethnic problems. This is part of the human condition now that we are in sin. But what God does... When he saves us, is he gives us the Holy Spirit. And so then Paul, trying to comfort these believers who are having conflict in their church, which happens in churches at times, he says in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Loving that roommate that's unlovable, right? It's joy in the midst of a situation that's difficult. It's peace regardless of your situation. 
It's kindness, being kind to people who treat you wrong. It's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control of your emotions instead of those fits of rage where you blow up. God has given us the spirit. Not only did God die, Christ died, to reconcile us with God, but he died to reconcile you with others. And so God has given you the spirit for that very reason. In Galatians 5.16, he says, live in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do you live in the spirit? By being in the word by being in prayer, by being in worship, by building your altar in the morning like Abraham. When you get that, that bad email, you build your altar again before you reply on that email, and then you build your altar later on through the day. When you're living in the Spirit, then the fruits of the Spirit start to come out of your life. That's one of the reasons that many times we struggle, we don't respond well to conflict, because we're not living in it, we're visiting we're visiting. We may read the Bible. We may not read the Bible. We may pray. We may not pray. We're visitors, and therefore, the power of the Spirit is not many times, is not present in our lives. And the people around us, especially the ones who fail us, many times bear the brunt of us not living in the Spirit. Now, here, Abraham, again, this is peak Abram, peak Abram here. Because he's building his altar. He's, he goes to the altar he built before, and at the end, he rebuilds an altar. He's hebroning with the Lord, and God says, I'm surely going to bless you. Are you living in communion with God? If not, you'll find that the, the fruits of the flesh, because we still, as believers, we still have a flesh that rivals the spirit, so that Galatians 5 says, that, so that you do not do what you wish. If you're not living in the spirit, this flesh will be very strong and your spirit will be very weak. Are you communing with the spirit? We learn something about that from Abraham in this text. Here's a second point for those who are taking notes. To respond in faith to conflict, believers must seek unity by considering our witness to unbelievers. Believers must seek unity by considering our witness to unbelievers. In verses 5 through 8, it describes the quarreling that's starting to happen in the land. It says, now Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, Abram also had flocks and herds and tents, but the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and herdsmen of Lot, the Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at that time. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine. And so what we see here is that there are a couple of factors that are causing problems. Abraham left Egypt wealthy. Pharaoh had given him much money to take his sister, which he found out was his wife, and then he sent him back. So he comes back wealthy after that situation. And it seems like Lot has also become wealthy. And previously there was a famine in the land. And so when the narrator Moses says that the land could not hold them, it's obviously not because it's not big enough, maybe because there's not enough food to spread around. Um, and in the process, the herdsmen of Abram and Lot begin to get in conflict. But then he adds something that I think is meant to jump out. He says the Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land, so Abram said, now, this could mean that these four groups of people are eating up all the food, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, Abram's crew, Lot's crew, or one of, the also, one, of the, uh, the, one of the other possibilities is because this is the very reason that Abraham seeks to reconcile, it could be because of the witness to the Canaanites and Perizzites in the land. Now, remember this about Abram's call. God was not going to bless Abram just so he could be a blessing to himself and sit up and get fat and happy. God was going to bless Abram so that he could be a blessing to many. In fact, all the nations were going to be blessed through Abram. When you get to Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, when he gets to the promised land, it says he goes to the site where the, of the great tree of Mamre. Um, the Canaanites, they, would, they believed that trees represented Fertility. So many times they would put shrines in the trees, and the great tree of Mamre, Mamre means teaching in the Hebrew, was probably a place where the Canaanites, like a Mecca for the Canaanites, where they worshiped their gods and the prophets taught. And then it says that Abram builds an altar right there where that great tree of Mamre is. Abram's kind of like that young Christian 
That's like witnessing the people on the subway and every person they get in front of. He's kind of like a bold worshiper. God has called him to be a blessing to the nations where people are worshiping all the different gods in the world. They're polytheistic. Abram's one of the few that worship the one God. And so he builds an altar, worships God there. He's just come from a failure in Egypt where he's become a stench to the Egyptians. He repents. It could be what he's talking about here. It's like, we've got to get together. Yes, we've got problems, but also because the Canaanites and the Perizzites in the land. The reality is, is that many times we, because of the conflict in Christian families, because of the conflict in churches, many of the Canaanites in the land get turned away from God. They look at Christians and say, hey, these guys are just like us, if not worse. Christ said this in John 17, in his prayer, John 17, 23. He prays, may they be brought to unity so the world may know that you sent me. One of the things that is affected when the church is living in conflict and when Christians are in discord is that it pushes unbelievers away from God. They start to doubt the validity of our master because of how our relationships are. I pray that they may be one so the world may know that you sent the son. Um, one famous pastor, one of my, fav my favorite commentators, just died a couple of days ago. His name is Warren Wiersbe. He's eight, he was 89 years old. Um, first commentaries I read, I think I was, um, I was in college. I must have been around 20 or 21, 20, 21 years old. I started reading Warren Wiersbe commentaries, and I just started to fall in love with the Bible. Well, Warren Wiersbe said this. He said, in my pastoral ministry... I frequently visited the unsaved relatives and friends of church members, seeking to interest them in spiritual things, only to discover that they knew about every church fight in town, right? And this would be an excuse for them to not accept the Lord. And that's true, not just in, in homes. It's often true in the media, meaning whenever there's something that happens wrong in the church, it's like the biggest thing on the news. They want to make sure that everybody knows that this is happening at this church and it's happening at that church. And what happens is it ends up pushing many people away from Christ, not just unbelievers, but many times people who were raised in the church. They get so tired of the church conflict and the church splits and the mamas, the mamas and dads yelling at one another, and they end up getting pushed away from God. Christ realized that the unity of these believers, first of all, he says this in John 13, 35, they will know you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. That this is one of the greatest, greatest Christian witnesses there is. Loving one another. Acts 2, the rich selling all they have to give to the poor in the church. And thousands of people are getting saved because there's something different about this type of love. Something transforming about this type of love that is wholly attractive to a world that's broken. But when the church looks just like the world, ends up pushing many people away from the church. And so what it could be that Abram's referring to, the Canaanites and Pesarites are in the land, and he says, so, he said to his relative, um, that part of it might have been the Christian, the witness of the monotheistic God. Now, how should we respond when we realize that Christian unity affects evangelism? What's, one of, what's our response? One, Certainly, we should pray just like Jesus did, that we should pray for denominations to no longer be like gangs, like, who are you with? Are you with us? Or are you with them? Right? Many of our denominations are not unified at all. Right? We should pray for the unity of the church. Paul, for Philippi in Philippians 1.9, he prays for their love to grow in wisdom and discernment. For the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 3.12, he prays for their love to abound for one another. Certainly... You should pray for New Harvest, that the church would love each other, that they would care for one another, that they would forgive one another. That's a fruit of genuine love. 1 Corinthians 13.5, I think it is. Pretty sure it's 13.5, the love chapter. It says, love holds no record of wrongs. See, part of our natural flesh is when someone hurts us, 
I, I, I'm going to talk about me. I'm a sinner. Hopefully, you guys are a little better than me. But I go to bed at night, and I'm replaying what happened all over in my mind. I'm like, I should have said this, and this should have happened. Our mind is like a recorder of people who hurt us, right? And so when we are walking in our natural, sinful flesh, what will happen is it's kind of like someone can hurt you two years ago, and you see them again. It's like it's fresh, like you're ready to go punch them in the face right now. Everything just kind of came back. That's part of our sinful nature, the selfish love where we are the center of the universe. Anybody who stops our happiness all of a sudden deserves our wrath. And so, but agape love, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, holds no record of wrongs. From the east to the west, so he has separated our sin from us. He doesn't keep bashing you over the head because of your failures, failures because who could stand? Who could stand before a holy God if he kept bringing up all our past mistakes? In the same way, when God's agape is working in our lives, as we pray for it for ourselves, as we pray for it for New Harvest, as we pray for it for the churches in Korea, then there's this supernatural love that holds no record of wrongs. We stop being astute historians that remember every detail or pervert every detail, however it may show up. But secondly, not only should we pray, not only should we pray, but we should seek to reconcile on the basis of our witness. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. He says, as much as, as much as depends on us, let us live at peace with all men. Meaning, you can only do your part. But because of our witness, like Abraham, we must be willing to step out there and seek reconciliation. Here's the next point. To respond in faith to conflict Believers must seek unity by focusing on our commonality in Christ. Believers must seek unity by focusing on our commonality in Christ. In verse 8, he says this. So Abraham said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. He says, we're family. Why are we fighting? Let's work this situation out. We are family. This is basic Conflict resolution. If anybody's ever been trained in conflict resolution, this is typically one of the things that they'll teach you. When we are in conflict, we tend to focus on our differences, right? She's like oil. I'm like water. She's like greasy and dirty. And we just don't mix. I'm clean like water. You clean things off. You make things dirty with oil. We don't work together. She's from a different culture. I'm from over here. We just see the differences, and those differences get blown out of proportion, causing discord. But... One of the ways that we can reconcile and work together from different cult, with, from, with people from different cultures or backgrounds is focusing on what do we have in common. And so for them, we're family. Many times you'll find if you work in an education system, you'll find people want to educate people the best way possible. The problem is they disagree on the methods. But the unity is we both want to see our students educated the best way possible. But they end up fighting over the details of it. Instead of starting at the base, this is where we agree, right? And in a marriage, we agree that we want to communicate well, right? We agree. We want to raise our child well. How do we do it? Starting at the base, what do we hold in common? And in a way that nobody else has, the church has a greater unity, things that should unify us that is different from anybody else. Paul, in speaking to the Philippians who were struggling with discord, remember chapter 4, the two women that are fighting, and throughout the book he keeps referring to them being one. It seems like this conflict between Yudia and Sintiq was threatening to split the church. And so in Philippians 2, 1 through 2, he says this, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, which you do is kind of how he's writing it, You've all been united. And if any comfort from his love, which you do, you've all experienced agape. Romans 5, 5, it's been shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. If any fellowship with the Spirit, which you do, all of you have received spiritual giftings through the Spirit of God. If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. God has done something in the church that is unique. He has, in fact, made us one and given us his spirit and forgiven us our sins and given us a calling and spiritual gifts and called us to, to get on a kingdom mission, we have things in common that nobody, nobody else has in common. Ephesians 4.3 says this, make every effort 
to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Basically, God has made you one, made you one. Now make every effort to keep it. He's already done it. You work at it. In fact, make every effort can be translated, make haste. Do it quickly. Same thing he says in Ephesians 4.26. He says, don't even go to bed. Don't let the sun go down without making this right, All right? And so one of the things that we must do is focus on our commonality, our commonality. 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2, Paul said this to Timothy, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers and older women as mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Basically, treat the members of the church as though they were your literal family. How you respond to the old men and how you treat the women in the church. Treat them as you would a mother or a sister or a brother. This is something that God has done in the church of God. He has made us family. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's the next one. To respond in faith to conflict, believers must seek unity by humbly putting others' interests first. Believers must seek unity by humbly putting others' interests first. Verses 8 through 9. So Abraham says this. Let's not have any quarreling between me and you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Now, Abraham does something that would be uncharacteristic in that ancient Semitic culture. See, the, 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 the Hebrews, basically, they had a patriarchal system, kind of similar to some, what we see in Korea. Abraham was the uncle. Right. He was the leader of the family. He's the one who gets the first choice of anything. Right. Because he's the person in leadership, not little old lot. Right. Abraham has the right. But not only does he have the right from a cultural standpoint, he has the right from a divine, a divine standpoint in this way. God has called for him to own the land. And so what does Abraham do? He humbles himself and says, you take you choose. He gives up his right as the patriarch, and says, you take the first pick. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. Whatever you want, we're family. He humbles himself, which would have been uncommon in that culture, and it's certainly uncommon because of the rights that God had given him, and he puts the other person first. Most conflict comes essentially from our pride. My way is the best way, which it is always the best way. Let me tell you, it is, just is. I don't understand why everybody else doesn't understand why, right? My way is the best way, right? Pride and selfishness is the root of most of our conflict on both sides. And so the way that you handle it is by humbling yourself. Someone has to be the adult in the building, and they humble themselves. Here when we look at Abraham, this is one of the times that he looks just like Christ. In fact, Paul says this to the Philippian church who also is dealing with conflict. Philippians 2, 3 through 5, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. This is how you're going to work out your conflict, Philippi, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God, his rights of God, something to be held on to to be grass, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He served others. You first. Right? He, came to be, he came as last on the earth. Christ gave up his rights. and He washed the feet of his disciples. He demonstrated looking out for others' interests over his own. He gave his life so much so. In fact, because of this reality, one of the things that Christ taught, those who are part of his kingdom will be known for giving up their rights. That will be an identity factor for kingdom citizens. Listen to what he says in Matthew 5, 38 through 40. Matthew 5, 38 through 40 says this. You have heard it said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. This eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth was legal terminology. It was part of the Mosaic law, but it's not just part of the Mosaic law. It's Korean law. It's American law. It's law all over the world, meaning that a crime deserves an equal consequence. 
If you steal, if you stole five bucks, you need to give at least five bucks back. Equal compensation. And so he's dealing with something that has not passed away. This is part of the legal system. This, what is fair? What's fair? But then he says this. You've heard about this, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. What? If someone strikes you on your cheek, I know you all hate this verse. I hate it too. Turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to take your tunic, your nice shirt, go ahead and give him your jacket as well. And if someone forced you to go one mile, go with him two miles. In the Sermon of the Mount, Christ is giving the characteristics of those who are part of his kingdom, the righteousness of his kingdom. Kind of like when Moses goes up on the mountain and describes the righteousness of the law, Christ is giving his law. This is what kingdom citizens will look like. And certainly we've seen this with the persecution of Christians throughout history. Matthew 5.5 5 says this, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What, who are the meek? They're just like Christ. When it came to other people's rights, Christ was like a lion. He goes into the temple and like a body blow, he flips over tables and pulls out a whip because people are being mistreated. But when it came to himself, when they lied about him and accused him, they're like, do you have anything to say? Not really. When it came to others, he was like a lion. When it came to himself, he was like a lamb to the slaughter. He gave up his rights. Now, there are certainly times, I don't, these, this, there's a wisdom principle for in this. I mean, there are times, yes, when we go to the law, God has given Romans 13, 1 through 7, given authorities to punish wrongdoers and to reward the righteous. Yes, God has given authorities for that purpose. And so not all situations do we give up our rights. I'm not trying to say that. But many times we will, and certainly in personal relationships, many times the way that we should respond is simply by giving up our rights. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Corinth who are suing one another. 1 Corinthians 6, 7 says this. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather just be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? He's like speaking to them like, you're Christians. You know this, right? Why don't you just accept being wronged? Like, why are you suing each other, going before the world and pushing more people away? Why don't you just give up your rights? This isn't a foreign concept, right? Speak to them like they should know this, all right? Part of the reason I believe Abraham is willing to give up his rights and offer the land. One, God has already told him he's going to have it, so it's going to come to him. But also, Scripture tells us by further revelation that Abraham believed that he was not, his descendants were not just going to get a, a physical land of Jerusalem, but also a heavenly Jerusalem. Listen to what Hebrews eleven sixteen says. Hebrews eleven sixteen 16 says this about Abraham and others of the faith. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In fact, when we get to the Mosaic law and God gives them the instructions for a tabernacle, it was a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle. Follow these instructions. There is a heavenly Jerusalem. A natural Jerusalem was meant to prepare them for the heavenly Jerusalem. One of the things that God, one of the things that if we are constantly in conflict, probably what our problem is, we're so focused on our natural Jerusalem that we forgot about our heavenly Jerusalem. That one day the meek shall inherit the earth. Go ahead. It's going to come back to me anyways. Right? One day, this is not my home. My ultimate home is a heavenly home. And God is pleased to call me a son or, or daughter because I'm not living for this place. And so therefore it changes the way that we react when we're in conflict where the world only has this life and only has this way, this is just part, just a shadow of what, what's about to come soon. When we're in discord with a family or friend, maybe it's just a picture that the world and its privileges have too much of a hold on our heart. And our hearts are not as attached to heaven and eternity as they should be. Many times it may say that about us. Here's the last one. To respond in faith to conflict, believers must seek unity by pursuing God and his blessing. Believers must seek unity by pursuing God and his blessing. One of the things that happens, he says, Lot, take your pick. And Lot, as you know the story of Lot, he looks up and he sees the plain instead of the mountainous area, which was Jerusalem. And he looks at it and he says, man, it's like Egypt. It seems that when Abraham sinned or had a lack of faith and went down to Egypt, 
While in Egypt, Lot, the Egypt gets into Lot's heart. He enjoys the wealth and the, lux the luxuries, even though it's a sinful place. And when he has a chance to stay in the promised land, he sees Sodom and Gomorrah, even though it's full of wickedness. And he says, it's just like Egypt. And so Lot leaves the promised land and goes down to pitch his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah. You know the story. Chapter 14, so we're in 13 now, 14. He ends up being taken out by these armies that were raiding that area. In chapter 19, he is no longer just, he's, he's, he's moved in in chapter, in chapter 14. In chapter 18, he's sitting at the gates, probably meaning he's an elder. The leaders of the land would sit at the gates. And eventually, he wanted Sodom, he wanted the wealth, and he ended up losing everything. Because it was destroyed. He even lost his daughters who eventually raped him and had children from him. Sodom was in their hearts. He was a believer, according to 2 Peter, a righteous man who was tormented daily. But yet he was a worldly believer who lost it all. And what Abraham does, he stays in the promised land. And God says, now you lift up your eyes. Lot lifts up his eyes to the world and goes off to the world. And Abraham lifts up his eyes to see what God has given him here in the promised land. Now, one of the things we can look at this from, a, from a, a, after the fact that the promise God was going to bless him for how he responded in discord. But this is ultimately true for us as well. How you respond in your conflict can affect whether you receive the blessing or whether you don't receive the blessing. How do we apply this practically? Uh, focusing on the blessing of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, in the same way, be considered of your wives as the more delicate vessel so that your prayers will not be hindered. Essentially, he says to these husbands, when you are living in discord with your family, with your wives specifically, it's going to hinder your effectiveness of prayers. It's going to hinder the effectiveness of God moving in your life. Um, Psalm 133 says this. Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when the brothers live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. What is life forevermore? We're not saved by being in unity. It's quality of life. It's blessing. It's like the anointing oil, the empowerment to do ministry that Aaron would have. It's like do a picture of fruitfulness happening in our lives that when we're walking in, in unity, as much as depends upon us, it opens the door for God's blessings. Um, I shared this with the pre in the previous service. There are times in my relationship with my wife where we have discord, and I don't really want to make up. I kind of feel like pouting in my room, right, and not making up. But one of the things I understand is that if I continue to hold on to this discontent in my heart, then what happens is it affects the, the power of my prayers. That means I go up on Sunday and I pray and it's like the heavens are closed. And I come up here and make an idiot of myself. For, forgive me for the language. Maybe I'm just too prideful. I don't want to look stupid without the power of God doing ministry. I go into a counseling appointment. How can I help someone that's struggling with depression or suicide? How can I give them anything if there's no power upon my life? if there's no anointing oil, if there's no effectiveness to my prayers. And so one of the things that we must do if we are going to respond in faith to conflict is look at the blessing. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. All right. Thank you, Lord, for saving me right there. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you for your blessing, Lord. But also I think I, I don't have this as a point here, but I also think it's very important to remember the consequences. Right? Ephesians 4, 26, and don't give the devil a foothold. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, where a master forgives a servant his debt, and then the servant for, does not forgive his servant debt. And so the master puts him into prison to be tortured by the torturers, and Christ looks at his disciples and says, so will the Father do to you if you do not forgive from the heart. Who are the torturers? I think that they're demons. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, hand him over to Satan, this man who's having sex with his father's wife. Satan is going to be the one that's going to torment him until he repents. There are also consequences. Certainly that should make us seek to forgive. Um, if you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you, Christ taught. There are consequences to walking in discord as far as on our side. But certainly we should think of the blessing but also of the consequences. How should believers respond in faith? to conflict and discord. One, we must live in communion with God. 
You've got to be building your altar in the morning before you start your day because you are in the flesh most likely when you wake up in the morning. Unless you had spirit-filled dreams and, <laughs> and worship music was playing, you're most likely you're in the flesh and you're going to have a, a tendency to have fits of rage and, and factions and discord. All the things that Paul says is natural to your flesh. If you are not communing with God, you're not going to find peace. You're not going to find self-control. These things happen as you're living in communion, right? Living in communion with God. Believers must seek unity by considering our witness to unbelievers. Lord, I pray that they would be one so the world may know that you sent the Son. There are so many people that are being pushed away from God because of the conflict that happens in Christian organizations and Christian churches and Christian relationships. And not only unbelievers, but the church as well being pushed away. Believers, to respond in faith to conflict, believers must seek unity by focusing on our commonality in Christ. Don't you have unity in Christ, he says? Don't you have comfort from his love? Yes, I do. Don't you have tenderness and compassion, a transformation, a new heart? Yes, there's so much that we have in common. Finally, believers must seek unity, not finally, but believers must seek unity by humbly putting others' interest first. And finally, believers must seek unity by pursuing God and his blessing. One of my hopes for New Harvest Ministries when you read that Psalm 133 where it says the blessing of when the brothers are living in unity, like the oil on Aaron's beard and the dew on Mount Hermon, and there God's blessing is even life forevermore. There are so many churches. I, I, I served at a Korean church for seven years in Chicago area before I came to Korea, and my church split before I got there. It split a year after I was there. I didn't know what was going on in the church. I've seen, I've seen many of my youth go away from the Lord and now come back that were previously with me during that season. Um, there are so many churches that are being affected because Satan realizes when there's disorder, God is not a God of disorder. He's a God of peace. And so he works to uh, uh, take away the power from the church and destroy it from within. And so my hope is that instead of having a dealing with, dealing with that, that for new harvest, that this would be a church that's receiving the oil of God. This would be a church that is like do, do in the family, uh, do with the families, do in the small groups, do in the outreach. This would be a place where it's like God's blessing is, even life evermore. People would come to this church and know there is something different about this church. Something different. God's favor is here, is they're loving one another. And people look at you and say, these are real disciples. I can tell by why, the way that they love each other, by the way they care for you, by the way they agape. It's not like there's not still sin, but when there is sin, you don't, carry, uh, you don't um, continue to bring back up the record of wrongs. You, you, uh, love covers a multitude of sins. There's forgiveness. There's working things out. I'm a sinner. My church is a sinner. We've got to work through our sin. We've got to forgive each other. We've got to love each other. We've got to challenge each other to get right. And certainly I pray that be true of New Harvest as well. As we close in prayer, could you take a second and pray for New Harvest? That God would make this a church that loves one another. Pray that God would make it a church of unity where there's unforgiveness and brokenness in marriages and in relationships. That by God's grace, there would be reconciliation. Would you pray for the leadership of the church, including your pastors? Because they many times, because when something goes wrong, people point at the leadership. So they're common to get criticism. Pray for your small group leaders. Pray for your worship leaders that God would protect them and bless them, that this would be a place where God is using in a mighty way. So please spend some time in prayer. Father, we just pray right now that your anointing oil would be upon every family in this church, that the husbands would love their wives and the, the wives would respect and honor their husbands, that children would submit to their parents and be trained in the Lord. We pray where there is brokenness, where there is discord, would you... Help them by your Holy Spirit to love, to be patient, to have self-control, to seek reconciliation. We ask that there be healing in the families in New Harvest and in Sarong in general. We ask, dear Father Lord, that there would just be a special spirit of love and unity in this church and that your blessing would reside. That your blessing would reside upon this ministry and that you'd use this church mightily for your name sake. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, God.